Welcome to the Lada class sub brief. My name is Aaron, your host. We're going to talk about this very interesting and new old stock or old style design submarine. All right, uh, real quick, my sources are a lot. We did a lot of research on this one because there's not a lot of public information on this lesser known Russian submarine. So, Our so. story begins really in 1987. Uh, the Cold War is really at its peak. This is right before the five year or so decline to, to the end of the Soviet Union. And they're just going ham with their spending, coming up with new ideas. A lot of the money at the end of the Soviet Union was really put into rocket technology and missiles and things like that. Um, but they also put a lot of money into the Navy. And one of the new ideas was let's get away from uh, nuclear propulsion for our submarines because it's cheaper for one and we, we can get a lot of performance out of um these these diesel boats these conventionally powered submarines and what spurred on this idea part of which was uh, from the kilo the kilo class uh conventionally powered submarine was a major smash hit success for the soviet navy um they built a ton of those boats and they improved and modernized them over and over again to where they were going to be very well. Uh, the Kilo is absolutely famous for being an outstanding sub. And this submarine, the lot of submarine that nobody knows about is the replacement for the Kilo. This is the new Kilo. This is the new super stealth sub that is entering Russian service as of this year and nobody knows about it. So that's what we're gonna fix today. We're gonna tell you about this new sub and what a hunk of junk it is. It's the reason why it's so secret is they're embarrassed to tell anybody about it. Yeah, this is a complete train wreck from design to construction to sea trials that nearly killed people on board. It's a mess. So this submarine was designed by the very respected Rubin Central Design Bureau. Now they have a ton of successes under their belt. They've built every major nuclear submarine for the Russian Navy and a couple submarines that were not nuclear as well, designed them, including the Kilo class. So they can design some freaking subs, but something went terribly wrong with this one. All right, this is a single hulled submarine. Uh, they did that for lightweight and most Western submarines are single hulled because we like to go fast and have lightweight. And the Russians are typically double hulled, but this time in order to save that weight and space, they, they went with a single hull submarine, just like the Western navies uh, typically go with. It has a minimum reserve buoyance, which means it has a small a hull as necessary to keep it afloat on the surface uh, under good circumstances. But you could take this boat to the surface and with just a little bit of water, excess water on board, make it negatively buoyant. The idea there is, again, is to make it as small as possible so it's light, thus go fast. Um, Unfortunately, that's not how it ends. That's not how it ended. Uh, okay, one of the re ways they're, they're gonna make this submarine small is to keep the crew small. And one way to keep the crew small is to add a lot of automation to the submarine. And the Russians in the Soviets era were very successful at this. The, uh, the Alpha submarine is almost entirely run by the control room instead of watchstanders around the submarine because everything is automated. And they moved a lot of that automation into the Akula 2, uh, also the Akula 3 now, all the modern, the Yasin, uh, M heavily modified an, an automated submarine. And they put a lot of those automation systems on the Lada, but they didn't fit. This is a very tiny submarine. And that's part of the problem is the modifications they had to make to the automated systems simply didn't work or they weren't reliable. They worked for a short time and then they broke. And this thing is always breaking down, which is keeping it from finishing sea trials, which is why it's been in development for 30 freaking years. You know, this thing went into the design phase when the American Sea Wolf did. We've had, we've had three American Sea Wolves at sea for uh, over a decade now. And they still can't, they just got one of these to, to, uh, to be commissioned. So completely different submarines and design processes but this submarine should have been in the water years ago. And, uh, and like I said, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get to it. So another thing that's really unique to this, and I don't know why they did this, but their diesel generator, instead of producing DC electricity that's then inverted to AC for the AC buses, uh, puts out direct AC current that they then invert to DC for 
charging the battery, <laughs> you know? Uh, but that's one thing they did is they changed the way that they uh, make electricity on board the submarine. And this is another system that always fails all the time. This is the prime reason why this thing uh, has been delayed for so long is this diesel generator to prime mover connection is unreliable at best on good days. It, break down, it breaks down all the time. And then the last system, since we're talking about everything that's wrong with the submarine, is the sonar don't work. And I don't know how they screwed that up because the Russians have been systematically improving their sonars since the 60s. And then something happens in 1987 with this submarine and they just go off the rails. I don't know if it's a brand new sonar that they never tried before. That part's not public. But whatever it is, it sucks. I mean, it powers on, it hears things, but it's not very good. It's not reliable. And the information it gives, gives to the operators apparently is not very good. So between the lack of a sonar that works you know, consistently, a diesel generator and prime movers always broke down, automated systems all the way around the submarine that are just, you know, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, depends on the day of the week, you know, the, it's the unreliability of everything on board except the sailors that is uh, keeping this thing from, from finishing its uh, sea trials. And this is all 1987. This thing's a freaking mess. Okay. Now we're going to move into the 1990s because a few things happened in the past four years, like the Soviet Union collapsing and, uh, you know, all the money basically drying up for any kind of military project, yet where they're building the submarine along with other ships and stuff. But they decide to keep going with uh, Project 677. It's formally approved in 1993. And they're like, get building this thing. It's going to be great. Replace the kilo. So the idea is, this is them going in. This is their LCS moment. Is It's going to be long range, high endurance, and reliable. And it's none of those things. But whenever they begin building Hull 1, that's what they're going for. The lead designer is quoted to the uh, TASS news agency, TASS news agency is saying it's going to be an undersea hunter. You know, this thing is going to go out and hunt other submarines and sink fleets. It's going to be great. It's replacing our Kilo class and the Kilo has a great reputation. So everyone's like, Oh, this one must be great. But this is before it ever goes to sea. No one knows. This thing is only shown up in drawings in 1993. It will be constructed right there in St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, at the Admiralty Shipyard. And the Admiralty Shipyard, you know, complex has, uh, you know, decades of history, almost over 100 years of building ships. So uh, the design bureau that made the submarine has a lot of experience and is very good at what they do. The construction yard that's putting it together, you know, over 100 years experience, great at what they do. And yet it doesn't work. What happened? Who knows? Okay, so from 1993 to 1997, we're, um, you know, they're, they're building the tools to make the submarine. And this is really, uh, this is not that unusual. For a brand new class of ship or submarine, getting the first one started is the hardest because you have to make a lot of special, you know, kit to uh to make the submarine parts you have to make the tools to make the parts in a lot of cases and so that's what they're doing for this you know four-year period is they're getting the assembly building ready uh the drawings put together what order are they going to build the submarine in because that's very important you cannot get halfway through a submarine build and realize you forgot something in the middle that you need to add okay, good luck putting that piping in so all that needs to be planned out and by 1997 keel one uh, f of Hull one is finally laid in St. Petersburg. It's called B it's called the St. Petersburg. That's the name of the submarine. It's a uh, B five, eight, five is the Hull number. And she is after a six year, seven year, uh, build period is finally launched. And here you see a picture right before her launch day. And she spends the next three years, uh, going to sea, uh, in the, uh, you know, up there in the Baltic, you know, mostly in the Baltic Sea, trying to shake out all these little bugs and problems that are with the submarine, because even as they're getting the submarine together in the assembly building and out here onto the floating dry dock, that you, like, like you see in the picture, they know that there's problems with uh, the, the automation and the torpedo room is not working properly. Or whenever they try to shift, you know, lineups from charging the battery to uh, just propulsion with the diesel generator running. Every time they do that lineup, they either short the battery or shut down the diesel. They can't get it, get it to work right. And they spend three years in sea trials 
uh, trying to trying to get that working. Uh, the problems with the propulsion, the sonar, or the primary ones that they're trying to figure out, and I don't have any details about the sonar system. All I know is that it's garbage and it doesn't work. Uh, in 2009, though, so while these sea trials are going on, they decide to announce, hey, we're going to build eight more of these. And, oh, by the way, we've been building one for Indonesia. We're going we're gonna to export this as well. But the the sea trials taking three years and the results of them being leaked out, you know, in one way or another in military publications are letting everyone know that this is actually not a good a submarine as, as they think it is. Uh, but they do go ahead and after three years commission this one in March, 2010, the Lada comes into service in hull one after 23 years of design construction and testing. They get the first one into the service in 2010. Okay, so the lot of by the numbers, uh, 17, she's 17,065, 1,765 tons. She can go all the way down to 300 meters test depth, 45 days endurance, and has a range of 650 miles submerged. And I'm sure that that was just a design number. There's absolutely no way that this submarine in this configuration, and we'll talk about configurations, can go that far. There is a drawing of a proposal for an air independent drive uh, for the submarine. But that is not what Hull 1 is. Hull 1 has a standard diesel and it's got a motor generator. It makes AC power for some reason that they have to invert into DC power. But uh, other than that, it's just a pretty straight lineup. But it can do uh, 6,000 miles at sea but without being uh, re resupplied. Um, so the 650 miles submerged, that's definitely air independent. That's not on Hull 1, but maybe they put it on the future hulls, who knows. Uh, two diesel engines, one electric motor, uh, shaft and screw. It does 10 knots on the surface, which is okay. But here's the kicker for all of the weight and space that they saved by making this thing small, which in the end made it unreliable. They didn't get that speed out of it that they wanted. 21 knots submerged for a conventional submarine in 2020s is uh, really slow. Like today's conventionally powered submarines are reaching a public under um, a submerged speed of 25 knots, which means it's probably a little bit higher than that. And so they're saying this thing makes 21 knots and just about every source that I read agreed that it's 21 knots. It does have six torpedo tubes. Uh, this one has, um, hull one has six 53 centimeter torpedo tubes and uh, 18 torpedo stows inside the submarine itself. Now those torpedo stows can uh, stow uh, caliber cruise missiles or torpedoes can be either one. So this does have the uh, potential to shoot cruise missiles. All right, so here's a line drawing of hull one. Again, there's gonna be uh, two other variants that I will show you later on in the lecture here, but this is the one they actually built. And so if you see up here, can we see my cursor? Yeah, we can, there you go. Uh, so up here in the front, the first thing that caught my attention is the sonar system from this line drawing appears to be you know, a, a directional system, which is very World War II, that you would electromechanically steer this thing around and listen to one bearing at a time or one direction at a time, not necessarily one bearing, uh, you know, instead of doing like a 360 search. So this, this drawing could be a little misleading, but if they actually projected the sonar system to be in, you know, the forward 180 degrees looking forward, uh, that's part of your problem right there is, uh, this system cannot see left and right, according to this drawing. But we'll see, I don't know how accurate that is. Okay, up here at the top, you have torpedo tubes. Again, they're all 53 centimeter. Uh, right here, this hatch is very interesting. This is the torpedo loading hatch. They can load uh, their submarines like a breech loader, like you load a cannon on an old pirate ship. You know how you put the, the, the cannonball in the barrel and you roll it down? Well, they put the, the Russians put the torpedoes out in front of the submarine on a little skiff that's floating on the water. And then they push the torpedo into the torpedo room uh, through this torpedo tube and this torpedo loading hatch right here. And, and then they hold up the 18 torpedoes in here. Down here, this is the forward battery. This should be an energy cell battery by today's standards, and it's not. This is old school lead acid battery, and this is why she cannot go 650 miles submerged. If these were energy cells, then she could definitely do that. But right now, she's got lead acid batteries. 
And this is the after battery here. In the center here, this is the control room. So here you got all your periscopes, masts, and antennas. This is the hatch that's watertight that goes up to the bridge up here in the sail. So when they're on the surface, you see people standing in the sail. That's how they get in and out from inside the boat to the sail is through this watertight hatch. And so uh, down here, all equipment rooms and some state rooms. Um, back here in these, this, two, this big open area here, this is where the crew and officers live and berth. And this is where all the washrooms are at, the galleys here. This, is, this space basically is all the space the crew has. Everything else on the submarine is taken up by motors, batteries, or, or equipment. So that's where the crew lives, right above the aft battery. And behind them is a watertight door, and this goes into the engine room. So the engine room has the, uh, the diesel generator right here producing AC electricity. Uh, I imagine the inverters right next to it because that's usually how that works. And then that back here, here's the large motor and then the smaller, uh, they call this one the, the creep motor. So if they wanted to go slow speed, long periods of time, they could just put it on the smaller motor. Or if they just wanted to run normal cruise speeds, they could use this large uh, creep motor or large motor uh, right here. Um, so this, this motor turns one shaft right there and a really cool thing about this and this is a major improvement this is the one thing that they got right and as far as i know does work is this conventionally powered uh submarine does have a towed array a towed sonar array which could account for the hull mounted sonar being as limited in scope as it is because they were going to depend on the towed array to provide that 360 degree coverage and if they if that's how they went that's fine that that works but you're not always going to have your towed array out. That's the problem with that, you know. So you, you need to have a hull mounted sensor that can see as near 360 as possible. And just by looking at this drawing and nothing else, that does, that's not the case. They do not have that. But having a towed array on a conventionally powered submarine is, is a rarity. And really says to me that during the design phase, they expected to get more power out of this engine. Uh, or the screw blade. Maybe the screw blade just is too small. Who knows? But something in the prime mover is not moving enough water around the submarine to push it at uh, acceptable speeds by today's standards. Now, keep in mind, this thing was still designed in 1987. So maybe by the standard of 1987, 21 knots submerged is fine. I'm just saying that they're using the submarine now, at least Hall 1 is here now, and uh, it's not up to today's standards, even though it's supposed to be the best and the most recent Russian conventional powered submarine. Keep in mind, this is not air independent propulsion. AIP has been the standard for 10 years now, if not longer. And the submarine is one of the last conventionally powered submarines uh, out there. But they'll sell you one. They are building an export. We'll get to that at the end of the lecture. Okay, so modernization. So she gets through, um, you know, construction and sea trials. They formally commission her, even though she has all these problems and reliability issues. And they're like, whoa, even though we've commissioned her, we have to take her right into modernization because over the past 23 years, technology has changed. We need to upgrade the components inside. So Central Design Bureau announces that the modernizations are going to happen. Uh, the Admiralty Shipyard that built the submarine is going to be the same place that does it. So they're already familiar with the sub. Because keep in mind, this is Hall 1 of a new class. So nobody else has laid hands on this except those dock workers. And then the uh, general director says that a lot of submarine will be stationed. Um, oh, he said that they'll, they'll not be stationed in the Black Sea fleet because the Black Sea is too small for the submarine. So a lot of uh, public speculation was if they were going to build eight of these, obviously some would go to the Pacific, some would go to the North Fleet, like this one ended up going to the North Fleet. And but with Ukraine in 2011 owning, you know, the majority of the ports down there around Crimea, that was before everything happened down there. Uh, they hadn't planned on moving these submarines down to uh, the Black Sea, probably because they had planned even back then to. Uh, to have issues with, with, with Ukraine and they didn't want Ukraine having their hands on their, 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 their latest submarine, you know, and just impounding it in port or whatever. So from the very beginning, from 2011, they were not going to have these go down to the black sea fleet whatsoever. Uh, one of the big things that they're working on is the combat system is being upgraded. I believe that is during this modernization period, 
that they could actually shoot that caliber uh, missile because that requires special fire control equipment to load the mission package into the missile. And I believe that's this is when they got that was 2011, 2015. Obviously, navigation propulsion systems are worked on, made more reliable, uh, as well as the sonar system. And that's what they do for four years, folks. So here we go. Uh, 2016, uh, construction is suspended. Uh, they ran out of money, basically, in 2015, 2016. And by this time, they had begun construction on hulls two and three. So we've got two keels laid in the construction yard, the ones that this one came out of. This one's complete and technically in service, um, but they run out of money, so they can't, uh, you know, they, they can't finish hulls two and three. Now, there is a, a TASS report that denies this, but it's clear that they suspended construction for something, and money's the most likely the, 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 the reason, because they stated that the money that was going towards this project was going to end up finishing the Yassin modernization project. And the Yassin is their most recent uh, fast attack, if you will, SSGN uh, missile uh, submarine, which is a very good submarine, by the way. So because they, they, on one hand, talk about not having enough money to finish it, but it wasn't really that. But yet they're moving money from this project to the Yassin. You know, they can't have both of those be true. So it's probably all about the money. But the very next year, um, they find the money to finish halls two and three. So we are going to end up eventually with three of these submarines as of 2016. Okay, we still got some time to go. Um, and they finished the modernization on hall one. So hall one, as of 2016, 2017, is, is really ready to go now. Uh, in 2022, uh, just this year, this was only like in May, like two months ago, they announced two more were going to be laid down in the Admiralty shipyard. So they're getting ready to commission hull two and three this year and next year. That hasn't happened yet. Hulls four and five have just begun. So they are at least going to try and build five of these, uh, despite all the problems that they've had with it. All right. So I talked about exporting. Uh, here is a picture of the export class. Uh, essentially, they pulled out the, the birthing area and they put missile tubes in there. And if you take a look at this drawing, they don't have any place for the crew to live. <laughs> so this drawing is really a pipe dream. It's not accurate at all, but it's the only one that's out there uh, for, for the Yamor 950. Uh, this is the one that they were building for Indonesia. Um, and with all the problems that they had trying to build their own hull one, Indonesia basically just stopped paying them <laughs> and, and said, uh, you know, there's no more money after 2009. We don't need the submarine anymore because basically they had been paying money into this program. Indonesia had for, you know, a year, over a decade and not getting anything in return. And the one that they had seen being built for Russia was, you know, not working at all. Nothing was right on it. But theirs did have uh, four 53 centimeter torpedo tubes. Uh, the 1650 variant that's not pictured here had um, six 53 centimeter torpedo tubes. That's and that's the same one that the whole one has. Um, but the one Indonesia was going to get was also going to be able to shoot 40 centimeter torpedo tubes because Indonesia has a large inventory of both 40 smaller centimeter torpedoes and uh, 53 centimeter torpedoes. But uh, in the 950 version, they were going to get 10 VLS tubes, and these could shoot the the caliber. Uh, cruise missile, very capable cruise missile, by the way. Um, but the design just doesn't work or it's not accurate. This drawing is not accurate because they, they put the missiles right where the crew and officers eat and sleep. And then they didn't add a space for the crew and officers to eat and sleep. So uh, that may, that probably has nothing to do with why Indonesia stopped paying them money. I think the reality is Indonesia took a look at what hull one was going through and was like, we don't need that in our Navy and just, stop the funding for it. All right. So this was supposed to be a diesel electric was supposed to stay at sea for 20 days, have a crew of up to 35 people. Again, the only way that's even possible is if everything's automated and you just have a watch rotation of like 11 or 12 people, you know, three, three watch rotation. Anyway, and that was the Amur class. So you may see a Mer class uh, talked about a lot with alongside the Lada class. They are essentially the same submarine with differences like the VLS tubes. That's a significant thing. Uh, they, this one was never finished. That's another thing. She was started. She's half built somewhere, you know, in Russia, but she was, she was never finished. And often what happens is 
it, after a submarine sits like this for over a decade, they, they begin to scrap her for parts to take a project that's in progress and help finish it. So maybe they'll reuse some of the parts for halls four and five that they're working on now. But that's all speculation on my part. We don't know. So what, what's the story right now? Well, we have one lot of submarine. That's really what y'all you need to know. We have one that's operational. Uh, it's in the Northern fleet. Uh, it, it probably participated in the recent war games. Uh, as far as we're concerned, this is a fully operational submarine, uh, despite the problems that the whole system has had. There are two hall two and hall three due to be commissioned. Uh, one is supposed to be this year and one next year that hasn't happened yet. So we'll see when we're going to see hall two and hall three, but for sure we're going to see at least three lot of class submarines operational in the Russian fleet halls four and five that are just being announced. Now, who knows if they're actually going to build that or not. You know, Russia makes a lot of claims and they start a lot of projects that they never finish. And this one has been so troubled. I wouldn't be surprised if halls four and five is uh, get, get, get scrapped. Time will tell. And if they do, we'll, we'll make a follow up video for things like that. But what we need to know today at the end of this brief is the lot of class has completed after over 30 years, one submarine that is operational in the Northern fleet. And that's where we sit today, folks. All right. And that's the lot of sub brief people. Uh, I want to thank everybody on Patreon who's uh, supported us. This is uh, you guys are like the foundation, the bedrock of what we do here. 